of 35, Norbert Oxanton was caught in a storm. He had not really been taking seriously his duties in minor orders, but when he foresaw in this flash of grace, truth and light that he was dying, probably because of a terrible accident falling off his horse under terrible conditions, then he realised what life was about, what death was about, and he came to. With insistence he demanded ordination, and he was actually ordained deacon and priest on the same day, something which was given to the order afterwards as the Norbertine privilege. Occasionally it could actually be demanded. And the the result was that he, in this love affair with the Lord, took very seriously the element of the priesthood. His life is spent in orientating souls towards love of Christ, ultimately in the Blessed Sacrament. He made preparation for the throwing away of consecrated hosts as a result of the preaching of the heretic Béranger, who was teaching that hosts consecrated by priests who were living unworthy lives were not validly consecrated. The truth was that they were consecrated, and these had to be recuperated and honoured. The thrust of the order then from the beginning was very Eucharistic, but it was not Benedictine, as it could have become, but Augustinian canons, for Norbert was a canon. Canons are essentially men orientated towards the official praise of majesty and the service of a local church. The rule that he adopted was that which had done that way back Augustine's rule, and therefore they live from the priesthood, not from manual work essentially, although as time went on the heavy monasticization of the Primos Detentions gave it a very monastic appearance, and there was that group called the claustrales, the cloistered ones, who did not have a ministry outside, but were living a purely contemplative life inside. That was the case for instance, at St. Antimo, especially when one did not have a ministry, it was very contemplative. And the rule was that the human voice should not be heard in the enclosure. 
It was only whispering and little BA messages written. But the very austere life and very monastic in tone. Now, the impetus that that gave was part of something greater, for in so doing he was drawing together many, many young men who would be very good priests, and therefore he was part of the huge movement of cleaning up going on in the period of reform. We're talking about the Gregorian reform, when there was a move to reinforce celibacy and also, as far as possible, poverty. This became then the canons regular, whereas canon secular could actually still maintain personal property. The common mensa also was part of the reform, and even canon secular would have that, but the canons regular also had the accoutrements of monastic life. He then had this intuition that he was going to reproduce the life of the apostles, a certain freedom to preach. He was one of the greatest preachers of the time, hence it is that he filled new monasteries, not only with men but also with women, and by the end of his fairly short life there were over 10,000 ladies consecrated in the monasteries of sisters, nuns, that he had founded. So we have this testimony that he founded a society of men who were prepared to take on both the outward appearance and the adornment of the new man, the first in the form of the religious habit, and the latter in the dignity of the priesthood, and who would undertake to follow the sacred scriptures and accept Christ as their leader. Now, St. Norbert himself saw the white habit, that's the undyed habit of the wool, in contrast to the black habit of the Benedictines, this white habit which is also undertaken by other parallel reforms like the Cistercians, the Montalese and the Carthusians, he saw that as a suggestion of the white of the angels of the resurrection or of the ascension. And this element of being free to follow Christ is very evangelical. He was in some way a forerunner of St. Francis of Assisi. Indeed, the movement of Canons Regular, the Primus Retention ones in particular, was the bridge between the purely enclosed life of the monks of old and the more open life of the friars yet to come, for he maintained the form of the monastic life with eventually abbot, prior and so on, although actually really the first abbot of Prémontré was his successor, Hugh of Foss, blessed Hugh of Foss, who put in print really the form of life, for St. Norbert had a spirit rather than a written constitution. So he then went on free to preach, and as time went on, it became an institution as we know it. But the oomph, as we might say, the actual impetus was that of this charismatic man who wanted to reproduce the gospel. And of course, because he was a certain figure in the medieval church, because of his noble birth and contact with people in high places, he became bishop himself, and he had a great influence over that part of Eastern Germany and Europe. And to this day, there is a certain influence in the Eastern Bloc, ex-communist countries. They were trying to reopen houses there after the fall of communism. But the tendency in the latter part of St. Norbert's life is to become very pastoral indeed, and therefore there is a certain impetus towards great pastoral work in the east of Europe, whereas in France it is more characteristically monastic. And that would partly also explain how St. Antima, which is of French origin, was very monastic. Now, 
we have also certain key elements which are very specific in his spirituality. He used to recommend three things in particular. Cleanliness at the altar and at the divine offices. Now that comes through to this day. Indeed, if one talks to Primo's attention and scratches a bit, one will find one thing in common, and the answer might be immediate. The big thing that characterizes the Missa Sumba, the High Mass, the Mass. It's always well done at a key moment of the morning or the end of the morning and given great attention and preparation. And in some houses, including Santa Antimo, it would be of the maximum solemnity, incense and so on. Indeed, at Santa Antimo and at the house where it came from, one day in Normandy was incense every day. So, luxe pour Dieu, luxury for God. Then, the correction of excesses and failings at the chapter meetings. We had daily chapter of faults at Saint Antimo, and the custom was to be prostrate and make one's confession. Therefore, one knelt first before the crucifix and the brethren made the confession, and then on they prostrate and was given the penance. Hence it is that things like silence in the house were maintained. And then in the novitiate we had the same, also the novices had their own chapter of thoughts. And then, and the care of the poor and hospitality towards them. As guest master for a good while, that was something that I was aware of because it is a point where one is a bridge between the cloister and the world and that role is important for one exercises the warmth and charity of the Sacred Heart towards people who come towards the monastery and perhaps towards God himself for they come from all kinds of experiences in our world and as it happens to have a very beautiful part of the world at Santa Antimo was a great blessing for nature heals and it is tranquil, away from the hustle and bustle of our busy cities, such as Rome. An oasis of peace. But if that peace is accompanied by a peaceful heart that welcomes, and the joy of giving importance to a person who might be badly treated, there is double healing going on. In fact, I remember somebody commenting on this in some message which came back. It was just a word said when the person or persons arrived, see, see, you are being waited for. And that very word had actually touched them. How good it is to be waited for. Accolienza, the welcoming, the embracing is important. And as Benedict himself puts it, in this way sometimes men have welcomed angels unaware. It's important that every person that comes is welcomed as if Christ himself. And then we have this fact that he preached so much that he filled these monasteries. At the time, because of his power of preaching and influence over society, it was thought that he would be far more remembered than the one that he actually knew, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And there was mutual influence between the two reforms. Much of the Primarchitensian life resembles Cistercian life, actually. But it was, as things turned out, to be quite the contrary. It was St. Bernard who would be more well-known and remembered. And the reason is quite simple. St. Bernard wrote his sermons. And so we have volumes of him in print and still read. And we have this testimony that at the time it was said, faith is Norbert's great quality, just as charity was Bernard of Clairvaux's. Apart from that, he was very charming and easy to talk to. That is something which is cultivated in the canonical life. Going back to the origins, there is a certain finesse and one is able to swim happily amongst different types of fish in society, high and low, meeting them where they're at. But that element of 
adequacy comes from the top, for St. Norbert was of high birth, and a certain dignity is there in the canonical life to this day. But one that is close to the hearts of people. Indeed, when preparing lectures as novice master, I remember in the directorium that we had, written in Latin, before the councillors, this element of the perfect blending between the formation of a premost attention and that of an eventual pastor of souls is such that if one is well formed in that intimacy with Jesus Christ, the High Priest, it can but produce good pastors of souls, for we love these people into being with the love of Christ whom one loves personally and with whom one is in relationship. And therefore, areas which are blessed with a canonry tend to have an area of radiation of grace and also of contact. They are cared for by a stable community and it has, over an area, a certain influence. In Austria, one sees the system of the big monastery with satellites around. They have the care of the surrounding parishes, where they might actually be living and coming backwards and forwards to the monastery, but not necessarily to sleep. It's a pastoral area, well cared for. He had the gift of appearing on equal terms with everyone, great, great or small, and so was liked by all. That is a model to follow for any pastor of souls. Finally, he was an eloquent preacher, and we know the fruits. When he preached the word of God, vices were wiped out, he said things as they were. Otherwise, preaching is self-seeking. And virtues refined by the fire of his eloquence, weeding out and planting. And people with well-disposed minds were enlightened with wisdom. One needs to have a store of knowledge, facts and wisdom. One must be giving. For that to be there, one needs, therefore, a depth of preparation. The pastor of souls must not be recycling the same thing. He must be ingesting new knowledge. And it is important, because that is what is happening in much of our priestly life, if we're not careful, being too taken up only with the pastoral, that there is no new element coming in. So one is recycling what is already known. He spent long hours meditating on divine truths and was fearless in spreading the knowledge of them. So this element of complete balance, meditating and then, meditating and then, has to be there. Otherwise one is giving more of the human and the human only has a human effect. Love's glory, the praise of glory, St. Norbert. O saint of God, who walk this way, on which the feet of many trod, we follow here an ancient ray. We travel in the light of God. To glory you have lent this throng of brethren now in raiment clad, of purest white whose triumph song bids us to follow him be glad.
O Master, we have heard your call and would walk on for to this place of majesty we will give all and hand our here on earth our days. The incense of the hidden cloud of witnesses who at the throne for now in sun and praise to Lord for us to hear all us has gone and so good master stretch your hand and beckon toward this choir where sound is made to move where angels stand and is to endless beauty burn.